Welcome to Executive Leaders Radio, your spot in the corner office, the radio show where executives share their secrets to success. Executive Leaders Radio. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohen, with my co-host, Shannon Lane, New Mark Knight Frank, Matthew Shapiro, Obermeyer, Frank Hennessy, Premier Planning Group, Ethan Milrod, GoTo, and Daily Tipton, Evolution Energy Partners. Ethan, can you give us a rundown on who we have on the air with us today, please? Sure, Herb. We have a great show planned today, including John Fury, CEO, Invax, Andrew Goldberg, CEO, RestoreCore, Jeremy Coote, CEO, Axis, and Peter Angelides and Lee Wong, co-presidents, eConsult Solutions. Excellent. Let's get to know our first guest, John Fury, who happens to be the CEO of Invax. What, what, John, what is Invax? What are you guys doing? Thank you, Herb. Uh, Invax is an immuno-oncology company based here in Philadelphia. We're working on therapies. Our, our lead program is in glioblastoma, which is a very uh, dangerous cancer, and in other forms of solid cancers. We're also got exploratory programs. Hmm. How many brothers? Where are you from originally, and how many brothers and sisters, and where are you in the pecking order? Well, I'm from uh, Dublin in Ireland originally, and uh, I am the oldest of four kids. I've got two brothers and one sister. Mm-hmm. Frank. So, John, talking to you, obviously your role, your passion is growing companies. Where did that start from early on? Well, I, Frank, you know, I suppose trying to find a particular genesis is hard, but, you know, I really get a particular kick out of taking um, a situation, a company, an opportunity, and really bringing it forward to, to maximize its value. That's just innately how I'm driven. I'm not a good person with status quo. Did you play sports as a kid? Yeah, I did. I, I played um, a lot of sports as kids, as a kid. Um, but uh, primary focus was in rugby, and I also did track and field. Okay, so there's 15 guys on a rugby team. What was your role there? Well, I was the fullback. Um, my job was the sort of last line of the defense, and uh, really my job was to make sure whoever got through the first line, uh, I had to take care of it. You know? What did that teach you about developing companies today? Well, you know, one of the things about rugby that's pretty unique, uh, if you ever look at a rugby team, there's a position for everybody from a person that's five foot four to a person that's six foot eight. And I think that's the beauty of rugby and the beauty of working in a business is the diversity of folk and getting them all to work together. Ethan? John, you mentioned you're the oldest of three. What, what was your role as the oldest sibling and brother? Well, Ethan, we, we were a fairly close family, all very close in age. Um, we moved around quite a bit as kids. Uh, my father was promoted. He worked for the, the, the government health service. So, you know, as, a, as the oldest kid, I kind of had to help the younger siblings navigate into, uh, into new environments. So Did being supportive parents, as an older... Did your tell you that, that you had to do that? No, not really. Um, I just kind of fell into the role. It was pretty organic. Um, not always well received by my siblings, but nevertheless, it was the role I felt I had to play. What, what does that tell us about you, John? Well, I think a couple of things about moving around a lot as a kid. Um, you have to learn how to read a room pretty well, right? Um, and you have to learn how to be agile. And you have to learn how to be uh, able to adapt to new surroundings and, and, and take, make the best of it. Daily? So let's talk about moving around. What, what, you know, when you're moving around a lot, what, what did that do to the Insular family? What did, you, what did you learn from that? Well, we became highly reliant on each other, right? Because you're going to be moving into new communities with established relationships. Um, I think for me, as I said earlier, it, it really developed an ability to be agile uh, and to appreciate, you know, you're going to take risks in new situations. Yeah. And how do you apply that in your business today? Well, I think it goes back a little bit to the question around transformation. I've, I've historically taken on projects that many others would probably not look at. Um, so I, I like the, the challenge of doing something that's unique, different, and has an impact. Mm -hmm. Shannon? John, tell us about your mom and what she was like when you were growing up. Yeah, my, my mom was a, a phenomenal lady. She was extraordinarily bright. She had been the recipient of various uh, financial support in her education. Um, she was a nurse by profession, um, but I suppose one of her greatest regrets was she was accepted into Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland as a, as a medical doctor. But unfortunately, her family didn't have the resources to be able to support her to go there. But she became a very, very successful nurse and nurse leader subsequently. And what did you learn from mom that you carry with you into work today? 
Well, I think a couple of things. One is that it's very important that opportunity for, 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 for women was something my mother pointed out in that, in, in that explanation of her own journey, but also for other minorities. And, you know, this is something I take with me. I'm vice chair of the Board of Trustees in Newman University, where, you know, first generation, over 50% of our, our graduates are first generation and kids from minority backgrounds. So that was a particular point to focus for me when I joined the board at Newman University. Mm -hmm. Matthew? John, you've got this uh, dependability thing going on, both in, 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 you know, playing fullback in rugby and being the oldest sibling. I'm curious, how young were you when that was showing up in your family? Uh, great question, Matthew. I suppose uh, it probably started and culminated when I was about 10 or 11, when we first started making moves. Um, I wasn't something that was requested of me. It was just how I turned up. So what did you do to be dependable and look after your siblings when you're 12, 10, 12, 13, whatever? What do you do? All right, well, we're all moving into the same school together. It's really a question of making sure they're settling in. Um, you know, while I was in one grade, you can be sure that the, the siblings of my friends were also in my, my siblings' grades. And just making sure everybody was landing in a good place and a little bit to help them read the room and understand who, who, who could be good friends here, right? And, and when you said before that it wasn't always well received by your siblings, how do you deal with that when it's not well received by your siblings? Well, when you're a teenager, you kind of ignore it, right? <laughs> you just continue. You don't have the subtleties of being an adult, but, uh, you know, it, it eventually got true in most instances. So it was really interesting that you said to me you don't have the subtleties of when you're an adult, because what I was going to ask is, you know, how, is that work? how does that play out as the boss of a place, right? I mean, you're, you're directing in the same way. Is it always well received? And what did you learn from your siblings and the way you dealt with them that helps you now in running a business? Yeah, I think that's something you learn as you progress through life, working life, you know, everything is a learning opportunity. And I think one of the things I learned when I went from a technical leader to a leader of multidiscipline, uh, disciplinary uh, operations is uh, fundamentally your job is to help people understand what success looks like. Um, you know, you have to paint the picture of what success looks like and then provide them the resources and opportunity to be successful to get there. Mm -hmm. um, it's a guiding hand. <laughs> showing the light and showing the way. When we were talking uh, <clears throat> in the green room, you mentioned that you had moved your family to China uh, to uh, take advantage of a business opportunity. And I assume this is your wife and uh, perhaps children? Yeah, I've uh, my wife, Linda, and, and my two kids, uh, Jack and Emma. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how young were they when you moved to China? They were seven and five, mm -hmm. which was what? a phenomenal age for them to move because they're highly agile, right? And... Uh, they went to uh, the International School of Beijing and they spent a lot of their tuition and uh, learning Mandarin uh, and obviously following uh, the International Baccalaureate. It's, so. see, it's, it, it's fascinating to me that evidently you respect agility because you just mentioned it. It was the perfect time for them because they were agile. Why do you have such a respect for this agility thing? Well, I think, you know, the, the world that we live in is so complex right now. It, it, it's complex on vectors of, uh, of business, of society, geopolitics, everything. Um, you know, we're so connected that you have to have agility in terms of how you respond to the various aspects of the world and your business. And so it's the connection that you're really that you're really looking for. It's the connection, and in order to have the connection, agility is what's necessary. I would certainly think if you want to build relationships, build business, build partnerships, have an, uh, uh, an understanding of your customer. You have to be agile in the way in which you approach listening to what they're telling you. Wow. So it's the oneness that's important to you. It's not, you're not the boss that sits back and yells and screams. That's just not who you are. You're all about the connectedness and the agility and the ability to understand the empathy to understand everybody else. Am I picking that up correctly? Well, I think the more experience and the older you get, the realize the less you know about things, right? So uh, having people that are a lot smarter than you in the room uh, is really important. And I think job of the CEO is to connect smart people together. I think the important thing in business is hope and clarity. What are we trying to achieve and how are we going to get there? And you're going to get anything achieved through great people. And that's my philosophy in management. Hmm. What's, the, uh, what's the website address of this organization called Invax? It's uh, Invax.com. <clears throat> how do you spell that? I-M-V-A-X. 
Com. We've been speaking with John Fury, who's CEO of Invax here on Executive Leaders Radio. Don't forget to visit our website. It's executiveleadersradio.com. That's executiveleadersradio.com to learn more about our executive leaders. John, let me have your website address one more time, please. www.imvax.com. Invax.com. Imvax.com. Don't, don't go away. We will be back in a moment right after this business spotlight. Stick around. You now can recognize your deserving business advisors on our nation's leading Business with Heart radio show, ExecutiveLeadersRadio.com. Yes, recognize you can recognize your deserving business advisors on our nation's leading Business with Heart radio show, ExecutiveLeadersRadio.com. Simply visit ExecutiveLeadersRadio.com, securely enter their info, and we'll reach out to spotlight your deserving business advisors on our nation's leading Business with Heart radio show, ExecutiveLeadersRadio.com. Don't wait. This radio and online social media and search engine exposure is quite valuable to your advisors. Yes, this radio and online social media exposure is free and quite valuable to your business advisors who deserve to be recognized. Visit ExecutiveLeadersRadio.com now to nominate your deserving business advisors. back. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohen. We'd like to introduce Andrew Goldberg, who's the CEO of an organization known as RestoreCore. Andrew, what is RestoreCore? What are you guys doing? Well, thank you for having me on the show. RestoreCore is a full-service disaster restoration company. What we do is when people have disasters in their homes and businesses, we come in and we clean up afterwards. So if you have a fire, a flood, um, we'll come in, we'll dry it out, we'll clean it up, and we'll put it all back together. Uh, let's see. How did you get a job with this company, Andrew? Well, my dad had a small uh, construction company that catered to high-end clients, mostly doctors, attorneys, their homes or businesses, and I was cutting grass, and my dad said, you're using my lawnmower, you're using my gas, why don't you come work for me? So he put me on the truck at age 14, and I've been there ever since. Mm-hmm. Matthew? Andrew, where did you grow up? I grew up in Harrisburg, PA. And do you have siblings, and where are you in the pecking order? Uh, <laughs> I have an older sister and a younger brother. Um, I'm the middle child. So you're the middle child. What that do to you? Um. You know, I was pretty much ignored. You know, my sister, um, she was like forging ahead and um, my younger brother got all the attention. So it was just um, mostly just me and my dad. He was my. Yeah, it's interesting to me that you say you were ignored because you actually spent a ton of time with your dad, didn't you? Tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, we have a special relationship. I mean, we've been working together. He's now fully retired, but we still talk just about every day. And probably one of the greatest gifts that I had in my life is being able just to work by his side the whole time. He's just a great guy. How young were you when you started working by his side? 14. <laughs> so we're actually even, even younger because he would always have me out with him. But What were you doing at 14? Um, well, as the youngest person and the smallest, you know, if somebody had to go up into the attic to run wires or down to hold a, you know, do something with a pipe, that was me. So... <laughs> And, and what did that all do? What did what did doing all those chores and tasks with your dad teach you that you're still doing using today? Well, I mean, th- those chores and tasks, you know, you know, there's nothing that anyone at my company does that I haven't personally done. From like I said, the lowest job to everything that's happened. But Matthew, I think it taught him about relationships because earlier in the green room, Andrew was telling us that a couple years ago he and his executive team really took on tuning up the culture of the organization. I think Andrew's developed a real deep sensitivity to the culture of the organization because of the relationship he had with his father. Andrew, is that true? Yeah, I mean, definitely um, what my dad taught me probably more than anything else is honesty and integrity. I mean, that's something that just was um, what he was all about and I took from it. now, as far as the culture of our organization. What's that have to do with building a team? Well, I think that 
on top of everything else, I don't know if it's a hundred percent connected, but the, we had a, you know, as we built our company, we got bigger and bigger and bigger and we weren't really paying attention to the culture of the company. And, you know, we're adding on more and more employees. You know, we have 85 employees at this time. And we, we did a deep dive critique of our company in 2013 in that deep dive critique. The thing that came out after interviewing many of our employees was that we had a culture problem. So me and my executive team, many, m- most of them are still with me today. We all got together and we said, we need to fix the culture of this company. And we realized after doing a bunch of research that it was going to be a very long, slow process to improve it. Um, but over the last seven years, all those little acts really worked well. Yeah. And the point is you are sensitive to the culture because of the relationships you've had with other folks daily. So when we were in the green room, you were t- I asked you about sports and you gave me a laundry list of sports to do. And then all of a sudden we got on skiing. Tell me about skiing. Yeah, well, I'm a, I'm a lifelong skier, but I ski raced all through um, from seven years old the whole way through college. And um, that was my main sport, still my main sport. And, you know, is that an individual sport? What, what I mean, you're... well, it's an individual sport, but in college it was a team sport because you'd take the top three teams, the top three scores or times, and add it up, and that was your. So it became a team sport. What um, was your I was role on that team. What, what, how did you contribute? I was the person who finished every race. Um, my senior year, I didn't um, fall one time during the race. So. Um, Going into our senior year, we were at um, – And what's that have to do with who you are nowadays? Oh, so, you know, I think that it taught me that when I was ski racing, when I'm sitting at the top of the mountain, I had to get to the bottom of the run, and there was no one there else to help me. So when I first started my business, everything was about do it yourself, do it yourself, do it yourself. But what I've learned over time is that I really needed to build a team around me Excellent. to help me. Ethan. Andrew, I just want to go back to your dad for a second. You mentioned he's retired, but has he ever come to work with you? Um, well, I mean, we worked our whole lives together. No, and so, RestoreCore. Yeah, what, rest- so we he worked with me at RestoreCore my entire career. And, he and just- today, are you proud of what you've made of the company? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, that's why I talk to him every day to tell him how to make sure he's proud of me. <laughs> what are some of the things that you hear him saying each and every day as you're growing the company? Um, well, what he often would say is that you need to take care of the employees and make sure that the employees are taken care of and also take care of the customers. And if you do those two things, then everything else will work out. Mm-hmm. Uh, Frank. Andrew, in your business, your customers are generally dealing with a sudden and unexpected disaster. Does that require special empathy and caring on your part? Yeah, I mean, that's something that um, I think that our entire team is trained on, but something that just is, comes very naturally to me. Well, how does it come naturally to you? You talked about an experience in grade school. Tell me about that. Yeah, um, when when I was in first grade, I got into trouble, and the teacher had, um, you know, was kind of giving me a hard time about, you know, probably talking in class or something. And as the first grade me says to the classroom, everyone who, who here who loves me raised their hand, and the entire classroom, <laughs> including the teacher, raised their hand. <laughs> so how does that empathy and concern for people help influence your culture at Restore Corps? I mean, I tell people that when they come to work for Restore Core that if you don't have an innate sense of the need to help others, then this probably isn't the best place for you to work. And if that is something that you really care deeply about helping other people, because what we do is very difficult. It's a messy job. I mean, every single time we get a phone call it is always because something bad happened to somebody in their house or their business. I mean, we, we often are showing up to people's businesses and homes on the worst day of their lives. So if you don't have that innate sense that you want to help somebody, it's too hard of a job to do otherwise. Mm -hmm. Shannon? Andrew, tell us who someone you looked up to as a kid. Who was someone that you looked up to when you were a kid? Well, um, my my childhood hero was Muhammad Ali. Um, Tell us more. I just think that he was able to like connect um, with the world. You know, he had a certain way that um, 
in a certain way about how he spoke and about how he um, interacted that just, you know, mesmerized me. Not to mention that when I was about eight years old, we stopped, my dad took me to his training camp and I watched him do a sparring session. He came out and he was like hanging out with us, doing autographs. So I just had always looked up to him. So the way he connected with people, really. Mm-hmm. And- Um, Why is connecting with people important and how does that show up today in the way you're building your team? Um, Yeah, definitely. I always feel like I want to have a connection with my clients and with my team that I work with. And I think that I encourage our team to also build those connections as well with our, you know, with their coworkers. And when we go into someone's home, we want to make sure that they feel that we really do care about what, you know, about their situation and helping them recover. Mm -hmm. It sounds to me like, you know, this ski racer where you knew that you had to get through it and you had to complete, uh, let alone the fact that you want everybody to love you. It really sounds to me like that's the reason Restore Corps has been successful because you've learned how to really build a team around you, but you know, you got to get to the final, you know, to the finish. Am I correct about that? Absolutely. You can run the perfect ski race. And if you fall in the last gate, you don't win. And in, in construction, um, the last 5% of the job is the most important. What's the website address for RestoreCore? It's RestoreCore.com. We've been speaking with Andrew Goldberg, CEO of RestoreCore here on Executive Leaders Radio. Don't forget to visit our website, ExecutiveLeadersRadio.com. We'll be back in a moment right after this break. Don't go away. Back, you're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohen, and we'd like to introduce Jeremy Coote, who is the CEO of Access. Jeremy, what is Access? What are you guys doing? Yeah, hi. Uh, so Access is a supply chain track and trace software company. We track items in the, in the supply chain, and we tell you all about their history. Hmm. Where are you from originally? I'm from a small town right, si- right outside of London, England. And how many brothers and sisters, and where are you in the pecking order? I was the middle child. I have an older sister and a younger brother. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, Ethan. Jeremy, tell us a little more about being a middle child. Well, I think it's the, the easiest role. Um, we watch our older siblings uh, get into trouble so we can avoid that, and we're not smothered as a younger child. So how did that show up for you, ages 8 to 14? I think it allowed me to go off and discover things um, without uh, being overly protected. You mentioned earlier in the green room that you grew up living a sheltered life. What did you mean by that? I don't know whether it was so much it was sheltered, but it was stable. Stable. Keep going with that. Yeah, so I was, I had a stable upbringing in a, in a small town. Um, I was, I had loving parents. I had a, a very stable upbringing. What does uh, this uh, level of stability that you had growing up have to do with what you're doing today as CEO of Axis? Well, I, I, it, 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 it allowed me to go on my journey. So I, I was very comfortable. I, I left this small town at age 18 and never looked back. I'm not sure so much what it does today, um, but I, I've given my own family a, a very stable upbringing. Mm-hmm. Isn't that what you do in the organization, though? Isn't that what you do for your team? Yeah, that's true. Um, I, I try and make uh, uh, work a safe place where they feel comfortable, where they, where they, where they can excel. Mm-hmm. You bring humor into it? Yes, I love to just uh, lighten things up. Why do you do that? Um, because what we do is very technical. It's very demanding. Um and I think though people take themselves too seriously sometimes. Mm-hmm. Or a how, lot important, of, um, how important is your intuition in terms of building this business? Uh, well, that's my 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 greatest strength. Uh, I once got told by a by a psychiatrist that uh, we did it we had a work that uh, you know that I wasn't I, I should always go with my first uh, uh, my first answer because I wasn't smart enough to uh, take detail and. Property so you, you pay attention to your first instinct. I do. Mm-hmm. 
And how's that help you in business? Uh, I think it allows you to be bold, to seize opportunities, um, to go for it. So if you're making a mistake, the good thing is you're constantly tuning something up as opposed to not being in yourself. Correct. And also, uh, you need to su surround yourself with a strong CFO mm -hmm. and maybe an attorney in the background as well. Matthew? <laughs> so what were you doing 8 to 14 for fun, Jeremy? Uh, I was speaking to Boy Scouts. So what, tell me about that. What was your role in your troop? We had a we had a troop in a, in in this town that I grew up in, and uh, you know it was it was very formative. We did a, I spent a lot of time Tuesday nights was troop night, and then many weekends camping, hiking, rock climbing. And, and, and did you become like the group leader or anything like that? I did. I was a I was a patrol leader, and then I went on and became an assistant scout master. How did that happen? Who? How did you get those roles? Um, by 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 standing out. I was a I was I was I was a good leader. People rallied behind me. How did you learn to be a good leader? I don't know whether it's something you learn. What, what do you mean by that? Um, I think you can become a better leader. Um, but I do think there is some innate uh, uh, skill. What, what's that skill? Uh, leaders are people who, uh, who who other people want to be led by. So other people want to be led by you? Yeah, I believe so, yes. How come? What do they see in you that makes them want to be led? They feel, they feel safe, they feel trusted, and that I will, I will stand up for them. Daily? Let's talk about mom and dad. What, what did they do? My parents were both school teachers. So that you come, you were, you had a lot of pressure from them and do, do well in school or? I, I, I didn't. Looking back, I, I don't believe I had any pressure from them. So, so where does that, where does it come from? What is it? You're, you're a well-educated man. You've done really well. Where, where does that come from? Well, my father was great in that uh, he would always in, he would never tell you the answer, but he would encourage you to go and find the answer. So there was a, a self-motivation there? There was, that, that led to, there were, things weren't, were never given to you on a plate, but you were told where the food was to go and get it. And how do you apply those learnings in your, in your business? And that, naturally being curious. Um, didn't you tell us that when you bring a teammate in that you want to find out who they are and the way you do that is you let them be themselves and watch who they are? Isn't that what your father did to you? Yeah, I think that was the connection. I hadn't really made that, ever made that connection till now. Mm -hmm. Shannon? Jeremy, going back to what Matthew was talking about, about leadership, um, in the green room we talked about, in your bio it even says that you're known for building teams. And you mentioned that scouts played a role in that. Tell us a little bit more. Yeah, I've, I've always been known um, and built, built some great teams around me. Um, and by definition, I've also been given the problem people to see what uh, can be done with them. Um, what do you mean by given the problem people and how did that affect the way you're building your team today? I, I, well, at Scouts, they would always put the kid that was, was misbehaving or was a problem into my control. And uh, I was uh, given the role to uh, make them perform. And why is building a team important? And where do you see that show up today? Well, you need a team. I mean, no one's capable of doing everything. And especially in what we do, we, we use technology to solve very complex problems. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not a technologist. Mm -hmm. Frank? Jeremy, what's your earliest recognition of a team? Uh, a patrol in Boy Scouts, I think. And did you have to motivate and manage yourself, or did someone motivate and manage you? I was always motivated by looking at my people who are leading me. Okay. And how, do you, how does that influence how you motivate and manage others, especially those that are difficult? Well, I, li I like to think that, uh, well, I, I, I'm definitely a person with a strong moral compass and uh, live up to commitments. People see that in me. Is, is that important in building a team? Yes. The people you lead have to know that uh, you've got their back. 
<laughs> Jeremy, can you tell me about the role of mentors in your life? Yeah, I've been blessed with a number of mentors, um, people who've been very influential, um, who have who always sort of spotted me and then, um, I don't know, I've been able to bond with them. You told us in the green room that you had mentors who gave you things. Tell me what you meant by that. Well, I, I, I think I was given things. I was given the opportunity. Um, going back to what I said about my father, always encouraging me to go and find the answer rather than giving me the answer. I was given opportunities by, by mentors. So, so do you try to mentor people now? Yes, absolutely. Tell me, tell me how you do that. Um, I, well, I like to mentor people, you know, out of out of college, starting in their careers, um, and help them, give them the opportunities that I had. What do you mean by that? Well, just giving them the the the, the value of the experience I've had. I mean, I didn't make every decision I made wasn't wasn't a great one. Give um, me an example of a bad decision. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I thought, you don't have to tell me the bad one, but tell me what you learned about it. Well, how do you how do you deal with a bad decision? How do you rebound from it? You just have to keep looking forward. Never look back. Is that the benefit of paying attention to your first instinct is that if you do make a boo boo, you can say, OK, what did I learn from this? And then correct it. So you tend not to make the same boo boo again. Sure. Sure. I mean, it can be painful looking back on a bad, bad decision. But you you take take with it what what, what, what you take the, any positive you can and you move on. Uh, well, Jeremy, what's the website address of this organization called ASICS? It's uh, accessinc.com. A C S I S I N C. Dot com. We've been speaking with Jeremy Coot, CEO of Access here on Executive Leaders Radio. Don't forget to visit our website, executiveleadersradio.com, to learn more about our executive leaders. We'll be back in a moment, right after this break. Recognize your deserving business advisors on our nation's leading business with heart radio show, Executive Leaders Radio. Yes, recognize you can recognize your deserving business advisors on our nation's leading business with heart radio show, Executive Leaders Radio.com. Simply visit Executive Leaders Radio.com, securely enter their info, and we'll reach out to spotlight your deserving business advisors on our nation's leading business with heart radio show, Executive Leaders Radio. Radio.com. Don't wait. This radio and online social media and search engine exposure is quite valuable. Yes, this radio and online social media and search engine exposure is quite valuable. To your business advisors who deserve to be recognized, visit executiveleadersradio.com now to nominate your deserving business advisors for free exposure. back. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohen, and we'd like to introduce Peter Angelides and Lee Wong, who are co-presidents of an organization known as eConsult Solutions. Well, what is eConsult Solutions? What are you guys doing? eConsult Solutions is an economic consulting firm that marshals analytics, policy research, and strategy uh, to help a variety of clients to get stuff done. Hmm. How large or how small is this organization? Uh, we about 30, yep. 30 people in our uh, world headquarters in Philadelphia. 30 people. And you guys are co-presidents. What, what's a co-president and why are you co-presidents? So it, it's exactly that. We are, we're both the CEOs of the firm. Um, so we share the duties. Uh, and that works out very well in the sense that uh, Lee and I have, have worked together for a long time. And uh, we are uh, jointly able to make uh, quite effective. What do you What do you guys do different from each other? How are you guys different? Uh, so I'd say I'm more the uh, operations, metrics, um, risk management, finance, billing, uh, assuring quality, uh, integrity, and excellence in our work. Um, and Lee is much more of the uh, HR and making sure that the teams are running effectively together. Mm-hmm. Frank, give me a hand with this, please. 
So, gentlemen, when you get under the hood of what you guys do, you really advance and develop neighborhoods and communities. Lee, you seem to be the people person of the dynamic tandem here. Tell me what you remember most about your community, your neighborhood growing up. I grew up in the suburbs, uh, had a bunch of kids in our neighborhood, different ages, different walks of life, but we were all together looking out for one another. And I think that left an imprint uh, in that uh, you can be different, but help each other and, and kind of be part of the same group and want to go in the same direction. Well, what kind of imprint? It almost seems like you guys have a civic responsibility to pay it forward. Yeah, we are a business and we have customers, we have to satisfy them, but all of our work is in the public arena and there's an audience uh, beyond the customer, which is the general public. And it's very important to our reputation that we not only provide good work and satisfy our customer, but that we advance the, the, the conversation in the public space. Mm -hmm. Daily? Uh, we talked talk about metrics and you know, math and other stuff, Peter. Where, where does that come from? Where, where, what's, what's the origin of that? Oh, I came out of the womb, I think. Um, so I've always been a, a numbers for, numbers person. You know, uh, I played um, baseball and soccer at Little League, but I also uh, spent a lot of time watching Star Trek reruns. And um, well, who influenced uh, you in this in this metrics math? Where's that influence come from? Well, I remember my my uh, physics teacher from high school was a, a big uh, influencer. He, we would uh, talk about life and uh, the big broader world uh, outside of class. Um, you know, he helped uh, introduce me to various opportunities. Uh, what what do you what did you learn from him that you bring into business today? Uh, just an a, uh, an open mind. Uh, the the world is much more complex than uh, it originally seems, and I think he was very helpful in sort of walking me through that. Mm -hmm. Ethan? Peter, you just started mentioning you played sports as a youngster. What, what sports did you play again? I played a whole bunch. Um, uh, soccer and uh, baseball were the ones I played outside school as well. Uh -huh. How about you, Lee? Did you play sports as a, as a teen growing up? Absolutely. Baseball, basketball. What, what, were your, what was your role on the teams that you played on? I was a point guard in basketball, so it's my job to get people to the spots where they can make shots and get them the ball. And Peter, on, on your teams, what was your role? Well, in soccer, I was the goaltender. Um, so my job was to prevent scores, not to make them. Um, <laughs> then uh, baseball, I, I played outfield sometimes, catcher other times, um, and I also would uh, keep score. So, so Peter and Lee, obviously, growing up and playing on team-oriented sports, uh, what does that say about your ability to be co-presidents today together? It, it is said that team sports uh, teach you how to play well with others, literally. Uh, and I think that that has served us well uh, in terms of having an objective um, and figuring out how everyone can play a role in getting that done. Um, and in that sense, you know, Peter and I work well because we get that. We don't have egos. Um, we just want um, our clients to be happy. We want our business to be successful. We want our employees to be enriched. Um, doesn't matter who gets the credit. Yeah, I think we're, uh, we're similar in ways that help us work together and we're different in ways that help cover a broad spectrum. Mm -hmm. Shannon? In the green room, we talked about how you guys were coworkers for a number of years prior to becoming co-presidents. And I'm curious, Lee, what did you see in Peter um, that made you think he would be a good co-partner? Well, uh, <laughs> to be honest, uh, uh, Peter was hired a couple years after I was and I was uh, flailing around in a project. And once Peter arrived and joined me on the project, he, he set the, the, the ship straight. And so I had an immediate good impression of um, somebody who could come alongside and see what, what's going on and, and figure it out and, and move the thing forward. And Peter, I'm going to ask you the same question. What did you see in Lee um, that made you think he would be a good co-partner to have? Uh Lee is, is rock solid, can see very far, is very measured, um, and is able to uh, sort of set very clear directions for his uh, people he works with and, and keeps things moving forward. Um, that, that was very clear. Matthew? Can I, I want to keep going on that a little bit. And I'm going to, Peter, I'm going to ask you another question about Lee. He's got this like cut to the chase thing that we've noticed in this interview he, he described what you guys do and at the end he said it was the job is to get stuff done for the clients and in the green room when he was talking about being a point guard 
He talked about distributing the ball, so we win. A am I on to something there? Does he does he cut through stuff? Explain that to me. Absolutely right. I mean, we uh, our, our work is often very complica complicated, lots of math and tables and all that kind of stuff. No one wants to read that stuff. They just want to know the answer. Uh, and Lee is incredibly good at helping remind everybody that, okay, even though we're really good at all the technical stuff, um, what people ultimately care about is what's the three word, two sentence, whatever it is, point that we're trying to make. And, and now, Lee, I want to ask you a question about Peter. And in one of the earlier interviews, one of our other guests talked about the importance of hope and clarity to a business. And I saw you emphatically nodding along. So here's my question. How does Peter bring hope and clarity to your business? The, uh, the goalkeeper role uh, is, I think, an apt one um, in, in terms of being the last line of defense and making sure that um, we are, as a firm, upholding the highest standard for ourselves, uh, for our clients, and, and ultimately for the general public. That sort of reputation um, is extremely important to us, and Peter minds that very well. So, so do you guys agree on everything? No. So what, what happens when you don't agree? Uh, steel cage grudge match. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's, we talked out. <laughs> there, you know, there's battles and there's wars. And, and so, you know, you figure out, like, we, we ultimately don't disagree on the overall thing. Uh, and so I think we're uh, able to concede, compromise, um, and, and keep the big picture in mind. And, and Lee's point about um, us not – really having big egos is, is a great one. Uh, we, we will talk things out, uh, hear each other's perspectives, and then ultimately come to conclusions that, you know, might not be to my first instinct, but, or his, but we get to where we need to go. Mm -hmm. So you guys express not only your thoughts, but your feelings as well to each other. Yes. Uh, it, it, you know, it's interesting given how quantitative we are that, as Peter correctly points out, um, humans uh, are the ones that still make the decisions. You have to appeal to emotion. You have to appeal to feelings. Um, and, you know, that that's the, the tough part about our work in a climate where facts are often dismissed. Sides are very, you know, um, uh, entrenched. Um, we have to figure out as a firm how do we inform that discussion in a productive way? So we have to practice what we preach internally. And that, you know, ultimately starts with uh, having two co-presidents having to figure this stuff out together. Yeah, and you guys are working on projects. So things are cha always changing all the time. It's not like you're doing the same thing over and over again. So things are in constant flux. You got to keep the pipeline full. You got to keep servicing the pipeline. You're, you're running a specialized agency. It's a specialized management consulting firm. It's about, Am I correct about that? There's a lot of spinning plates, yes. A lot of spinning plates. So you guys really have to work in concert with each other on a whole mess of different levels. It sounds to me like you do, and I bet the benefit to your team is that there's longevity, and I bet the benefit to the clients is because the team's been there a long time, the clients get better service. Am I correct about that? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, uh, we... Um, uh, pride ourselves in being very involved with our clients. Mm -hmm. They know that we care about them, about yep. the work that's being done. We care mm -hmm. about our reputation. Mm -hmm. And so um, that, that, that's what we're getting hired for. What is the website address for eConsult Solutions? eConsultSolutions.com. E -consult We've been speaking with P Peter Angelides and Lee Wong, co-presidents of eConsult Solutions. Ethan, can you give us a rundown of who else you've had the opportunity of speaking with today, please? Sure, Herbert. Great show today, including John Fury, CEO of Impact, Andrew Goldberg, CEO of RestoreCore, Jeremy Coote, CEO of Axis, and Peter Angelides and Lee Wong, co-presidents of eConsultant. <laughs> I'd like to thank my co-hosts, including Shannon Lane, Newmark Knight, Frank, Matthew Shapiro, Obermeyer, Frank Hennessy, Premier Planning Group, Ethan Milrod, GoTo, and Daley Tipton, Evolution Energy Partners, for giving me a hand structuring the questions, for providing our listening audience an educational and entertaining show. I'd like to thank our listening audience for listening. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a radio show. Don't forget to visit our website, executiveleadersradio.com, to learn more about our executive leaders. Thank you, and have a nice day. Bye-bye.